Tripp, I think that's exactly what we all needed in the evening. It was simple, it was sweet, it was clear, it was encouraging, inspiring. Uh, a simple exposition of scripture, a little humor along the way, good application. Thank you, brother. Served, I think, all of us well. From you or any of you, one or two encouraging stories of either sharing the gospel, seeing a conversion, either from you or maybe a missionary that you support. Just an encouraging sharing the gospel or a conversion story from you or a missionary you support. Anybody. So I tell a story uh, about uh, the pastor that is leading our first church plant. He's in a very similar neighborhood in Northeast DC, laboring there. He's in the park, often talking with heroin addicts and, and others. I mean, just hard ground um, soldiering. And uh, in the building where he meets, there's another quote unquote church uh, that meets there. I say quote unquote because it's uh, opening and affirming of homosexuality and things of that sort. And he's often prayed that um, folks would wander into his service thinking it was the other service. <laughs> and one Sunday a woman does. And he tells her she should stay. And she does and she enjoys the service and she keeps coming. After several weeks of attending, um, she shows up at his house with a letter. She says, I'm at work and I can't stop thinking about what I'm hearing. You're really messing up my life and I need to give you this. And she gives him a letter in which she has, you know, in several pages, just detailed her sins in confession uh, and repentance. Now she was married to another woman, had been living in that lifestyle for many years. Um, and God mercifully converted her. She divorced her wife, she's been baptized, she's in, in the fellowship of that congregation. Uh, it's just a marvelous example uh, of God saving power, the brother who's just being faithful to, to preach the word and God giving the increase. Praise the Lord, thank you. Um, there was a, several years back, I did a concert somewhere, somebody came up to me after the concert, they were clearly really wrestling with a lot of stuff. Uh, he said, I don't even know how I got here. I'm not a believer. He said, but I'm having a rough season in my life. My, my, girlfriend, my girlfriend is pregnant. We both think she should just get an abortion. Uh, but I'm, I, when I get beyond that, I just don't know what to do with my life. So I shared the gospel with him, encouraged him to, to cherish the value of human life that the Lord had given him and his girlfriend. And we talked and prayed for him and, and went on. And it didn't seem like anything had really sunk in at all. So I prayed for him again and probably and eventually forgot about him a few years later. Uh, then like maybe five years later, he comes to another concert and says, you probably don't remember me, but he said, I came to a show one time. I didn't know Jesus. He said, that night you talked to me. You didn't say anything special. You told me about what Jesus had done on the cross. The Lord saved me from my sins. Um, he said, uh, uh, me and my girlfriend talked and we changed our mind and we kept the child and we got married. Our child is a few years old. We know Jesus. We're walking with Jesus. And thank you for just telling me about Jesus. And it was one of those times where I had no idea the Lord was doing anything at all. And I'm sure there are millions of times like this. We have no idea what the Lord is doing through us just being simply faithful. I could have never seen this guy again. And the Lord just used a simple act of probably clumsy sharing of the gospel to, to change some lives. It's remarkable. Six years ago, my, my dad passed away. I told these guys this earlier today. Uh, three years prior to that, at age 71, he found Christ. Uh, we had prayed for him for 36 years. Uh, my little brother, uh, who's a church planter in Ohio, had been sharing the gospel with him. I had been talking with him. Uh, my dad called my brother one day and said, you know, we've been talking about this Jesus thing. Uh, I need to talk. My brother said, let's plan a time. My dad said, no, we need to talk now. Uh, my dad made his way to my brother's house and my brother said, I'll help you pray. My brother launched into a prayer. My dad took it from there and God radically, radically, radically changed my dad. So the last three years of his life were uh, unbelievably different from the previous years. And I, and I think about that a lot because my mom is still not a believer at age 77, uh, but I know what God can do. 
and she has seen the grace and the power of God. And we just keep praying for God to do that. I got a WhatsApp message earlier today uh, from Steve Jennings. He's a pastor in uh, Fajera, which is on the other side of the United Arab Emirates on the Indian Ocean. And the WhatsApp message had a photo of a guy who was about to be baptized. Steve said, uh, we baptized this guy today. Uh, he was introduced to the gospel at your church, the United Christian Church of Dubai. Then he moved to Fajera, where he was converted, and he's being baptized today. So praise God for that. That's wonderful, brother. Yeah, we, we've got a, a guy who recently joined our church who's Iranian, and one of the wonderful things about his conversion is the story spans about 15 years. He, he was living in Iran. Someone gave his dad a New Testament. His dad kept it. This guy took it without his dad's permission, which probably wasn't good, but it turned out well. He took it, started reading it secretly, got interested in that, met a couple of people who were Christians over the next 10 years, asked them some questions, still had a ton of questions, eventually comes to the U.S. to study in West Virginia to go to graduate school. Turns out one of the professors he's working for is a believer. The professor explains the gospel to him, brings him to his church. He starts attending the church regularly. He said he met up with the pastor for about a year, studying through the gospels, asking him questions. He's eventually converted and baptized. Then he moves to DC to get a job and now he's a member of our church. But here's just a wonderful reminder that, that lots of folks, their story of conversion is a long story involving lots of different people's faithfulness and, uh, and exposure to God's word. So mm -hmm. now he's a faithful member of our church. Mark, will you lead us in prayer, thanking God for these conversions and asking for more? Lord, you've heard each one of these stories. Lord, you're the author of them. Uh, we pray that you would make us and our churches faithful in our evangelism. We pray for all of the missionaries that we support, some of whom have been laboring for years without seeing anyone converted. Lord, we pray that even today you would pour out your Holy Spirit and you would bring many men and women to come to know yourself. Lord, we pray that even if there's some here at this conference who don't know you, you'd bring them clearly to know yourself. Lord, get glory to yourself, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Trip, at one point you, had, you kept using that phrase, that would be foolish unless they were eternally perishing. How often do you guys preach about hell, eternal perishing, and or... Do you think pastors generally do a good job of this? Um, I, I try to, whenever I preach, I try to be clear about how someone can be saved. And I try to, um, most of the time, be clear about what's at stake if we don't trust Jesus, that we're gonna be punished for our sins. So I'm, I'm not often doing series three or four part series on the hell itself, but I'm trying to be clear when I'm sharing the gospel. And one of the reasons I think that's important to talk about part of what's at stake is our eternal separation from God is because as time goes on and people continue to hear, uh, the concept of hell sounds gross to people and um, more and more uh, talking about that seems really harsh to people's ears and for um, Christians who are part of churches that I help pastor, I want to make sure that we don't kind of block the idea out. I want to make sure that God's justice doesn't sound gross to us, but it sounds good. Uh, and so when people share the gospel with others, um, that the way that I share it when I preach could be a model for how they will when they talk to their non-believing friends. L let me understand what you just said a little bit better. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you saying you don't emphasize the severer aspects of hell? You no, I'm saying that I... So if I come upon a text that's talking about hell clearly, then yes. I'm just saying I, um, I try to, whenever I share the gospel in a sermon, I try to be clear about hell. Um, so that the church emulates you in it. Yes. So that we don't find the severer aspects uh, gross I or see. we don't think they're ugly. You kind of ragged on the idea, though, in one of your throwaway lines about needing to preach the law of God and crush the person's spirit before they can come to Christ. Um, I was not trying to do that. Uh, my goal was to say that we shouldn't think that if we do that, then someone's automatically going to get saved like it's a magic trick. Certainly true. Yeah. Anybody else on this topic of talking about eternal perishing, the necessity of it, whether we shy away from it, any, any exhortation here? 
I, I think it's terribly important. I just did a message on Roman, uh, Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19, about the wrath of God. Uh, I think if our people don't understand that God is wrathful, if they're defensive, they don't understand that he's good, that he's wrathful because he's good, uh, then they're going to have a very hard time getting excited about the gospel. So I think we have to be unapologetic and clear uh, about God's justice. I don't think we can emotionally rejoice in it in the way we will ultimately when we're glorified in heaven. I think we can erratically and inconsistently rejoice in it. But I do think it's clearly true in Scripture, and I think we need to preach it clearly. Tripp, you talked about preaching the gospel with urgency. Mark, in your chapter on Nine Marks on Evangelism, you often talking about sharing the gospel with urgency. Anybody, brothers, what does it sound like? Give us words to share the gospel, train us. What does it sound like to share the gospel with urgency? What words do you use? Well, I tried to do that earlier today, so you heard me do that this, this afternoon. That's what I would call urgent. Remind us, what did you? I encourage people to repent of their sins and trust in Christ. Okay. Yeah, I think urgency for me is not, it's not so much a change of the wording, it is the choice that I make that this is such an urgent message that I choose to speak it more recurrently to people. Yeah, and I think, Tripp, I think, you know, what made your explanation of the gospel urgent news is not that we yeah, have a particular tone of voice or we say particular things or we're passionate in a particular way, but that we recognize that it's news that demands, even you know, commands a response from our listeners. I think an urgent gospel message is one that ends with, you know, Jesus is commanding everyone everywhere to turn from their sins and trust in him. And, uh, yeah. And I think, uh, I think Max Stout, I can't remember the exact words he's, but he'll often talk about when we share the gospel with people, we shouldn't just, just say the true news, we should also try to persuade them. We should also press on them the urgency of responding to the news that God has laid before us. Paul clearly does that regularly in the book of Acts. Yeah. Now, kind of transitioning a little bit to some of your earlier comments, brother, about patience. So from urgency to patience, uh, any confessions from you guys on uh, how you've been to, tempted to despair amidst patience, or the need for patience? Have you found yourself struggling with being patient as you've shared the gospel and nothing's happening? Or flip side, encouragement, f encouragements you've had towards patience. You were saying patience over and over and over. I just want to hear from you brothers and your experience of that. Well, a slight encouragement. One thing that's helped me with patience is to have a 10-year time horizon or 20-year time horizon. Mm -hmm. I think if we think what we want to accomplish in the next six months, we may result in, that may result in our being discouraged. But if you think of 10 years or 20 years out, then I think that helps us to be patient. It puts things in perspective. That's good. I, I remember as a young preacher, I don't, I don't know if I want to say this, but uh, I learned how to preach 10-minute messages, and when I was very young, I'm 16, uh, you preach a short message and have about a 30-minute invitation uh, because <laughs> you, just, you just want somebody to respond right then. And, it's, and it was a longing of my, it genuinely was a longing of my heart. I wanted to see somebody respond because what was so powerful in my life, I couldn't envision why anybody would reject that. Uh, and so I, I had to learn that how you present the gospel, how you proclaim the gospel, how you call for a response also reflects how you understand urgency, how you portray urgency, and sometimes how you distort urgency in, in for me, that, that Almost, I'm not going to stop the response time until somebody does something. Uh, and I still would call people to a response. I still long for a response. I still grieve when no one responds. Uh, but I've come to realize that it's not the length of the response time that makes the difference. Mm, good. Because yeah, I think if you're trying to do what Paul is doing in Acts and persuade people, then urgency cannot mean bypassing understanding, right? And understanding in some ways is setting the pace of patience, right? So, so we want folks to have, have an informed response to the gospel. My, 
merely an emotional response or not merely godly sorrow or, excuse me, worldly sorrow. Uh, we, we wanted to be godly sorrow. We wanted to be understanding of some basic truths about who God is and, and who we are before him uh, in his holiness and uh, lordship and what we owe him in the way of reverence and repentance and faith. And um, I, I think that act of teaching. So do you yeah. sometimes slow people down and say, I'm not sure you do understand? Yeah. I think, you see emotional think responses. Of, I'm not sure that's an informed response. Well, it, it just goes back to the, you know, conversion, right? We want to be careful with people's conversions. Yeah. Um, and, and, and by careful, I, I mean, we, we want to ask some basic questions about understanding uh, and, and encourage them in the truth uh, of the gospel. In that way. You all have a sister here in the area, Rosaria Butterfield. Uh, Kent Butterfield's wife. She lives over in Durham. Kent's a Presbyterian pastor. She wrote a book a few years ago called Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Uh, there is a great example of exactly what you two are talking about, about a conversion that happens over a period of time and somebody sharing the gospel, patiently listening, understanding her, but pressing in on the commands. Yeah. And, and in our sort of experience, I mean, we may be the last guy who talks to this brother who's had a faithful dad planting seed for decades, we come along in water and, you know, the Lord gives increase. And so patience in that sense might be one conversation with that brother. Or we may be on the sort of longer end of doing the, the planting and the watering um, and, and it's decades. And so it, patience too isn't just one thing. Um, I, I think it's determined in that interaction in some ways. I was going to say, I I, um, yeah, my unbelieving heart, whenever I don't see lots of fruit right in front of me all the time, I always just forget that God does amazing things. And so it's helpful to me to hear people talk about how God saved them as often as possible. Always asking people, share that testimony because it's a reminder in all these different circumstances, God is still saving people. He does it all the time and he always does it through the means that he's given. Uh -huh. That gives me the reminder and confidence to be patient and just keep doing what God has told me to do. Wonderful quotation in Charles Bridges' book, The Christian Ministry. The seed may lie under the earth until we do, and then spring up. Praise God. So if you're like me, if you have a son or a daughter who's not converted, you know, you don't have to outlive them. You know, you, you never know. It may be after the Lord calls you home. That's one of the things the Lord will use to break their heart. And push them to realize that there's nobody going to be around doing that anymore. Now it's really just over to you and me. And just pray the Lord would use it to convert them. Do one of you brothers want to explain what just rapid multiplication missions is and why it's a big deal or not a big deal? Do we need to be scared of it? Is it really bad? Is it just, can somebody give us a quick tutorial on this, this phenomenon. You, you referred to it a few times in your talk, Andy. What, what is rapid multiplication or movement? Do you want to refer to anything on the Nine Marks website in case there's people want to have more time than we've got right now to look uh, at this? There's two journals we've done on missions. One from 2009 with a generic green cover just called Missions. Uh, there's a couple of articles in there, and more recently we did a journal on the Nine Marks, a journal a year ago or so, called Missions Zeal Without Wisdom. I think that's a lot of missions out there, Zeal Without Wisdom. And then, again, there's an article or two in that. Uh, I think, I, Jimmy, what I'm thinking about, and what makes this really hard, it's not like you can just put your finger on this particular you know, this particular strategy or this book or this program or this workbook or this methodology. I thought you could. You can, but then there's just another one will pop up. It's like whack-a-mole. Oh, 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 yeah. oh, I see. Yeah, and maybe you can't. And the, the other thing about it is that people will, some people will use some of the same terminology and they'll talk about rapid church planting and they just mean we want churches that will plant other churches. Yeah. Well, that's fine. We're all, I hope, in favor of that. What should we what, be concerned what, about? I'm really concerned about I'm, I'm winding up, man. It's, I haven't had much coffee. This takes a while, okay? I'm <laughs> winding up. But what we really, I think, need to be concerned about, it's, it's a disposition of the heart that says this has got to happen faster. Instant oatmeal. Yes. It's, 
anytime you're dealing with mission strategy where people are saying, maybe they include the word rapid in their definition of what success is. Like successful missions will be a rapid expansion of the gospel, a rapid planning of churches. And what that does, I mean, it's not that we're against things happening fast, but what it means is you've, you've suddenly decided if God doesn't make stuff happen fast, well, by golly, I will. I'm gonna do something so that there's some immediate visible response. It's, it's, it's a state of mind in one sense. I mean, you could, you could name certain things, but it's really just an attitude of the heart that says, I'm gonna add a promise of God, speed, where God hasn't promised a particular speed. He's, he says that he'll always be at work even while we're sleeping. You know, the seed may, may be growing whether we labor or sleep, but he doesn't say how fast it's gonna happen. And the, that disorients missionaries away from asking the questions, what has God commanded me to do? Am I doing that faithfully? Are there ways I could do that better? It takes our eye off of what we've been told to do, like Tripp was saying, and puts our eyes on what the response is from the culture around us. And I find that's just very, very dangerous for missionaries. Andy, am I right in thinking that often they'll refer to passages like Acts 20, where Paul goes somewhere for three months and then he has to leave for one reason or another, but the church grows and they'll, they'll point to passages like this and say, he was there for three months and he managed to plant a church or two, that's what we should be doing. So you see somebody get converted, make the first convert an elder, move on to the next town. Is that kind of what happens? Or am I being unfair and generalizing? I think that's certainly what some people think. And, and maybe what they think they see in Acts. It's a long conversation. But one, you know, Paul doesn't ever have like a rapid strategy. He leaves places because he gets kicked out. Right. You know, the only time he goes places intentionally for short periods of time is to go back and visit the brothers and see how they're doing where there are already churches. Yeah. So he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a rapid strategy in that sense. And then, yeah, it just gets into a long conversation of what, what's really happening there? What work has God been doing in those people's lives before? Do those people already know the scriptures backward and forward probably better than we do from Judaism? You know, there's just a lot of things that have to be right. plumbed well, there. Uh, and let me add, I do think, I think what Andy said is important. We really do have to have the conversation with missionaries on the ground to find out what do they mean by rapid? Because what we hear as rapid may not be what they mean. Uh, even when it's in their definition, it may not be. And I, and I agree with you, when we're, when we're aiming for rapid as if that's the only acceptable way to do this, and in so doing, we compromise what we're doing in planting healthy churches, we've got a problem. Uh, but again, I, w I want us to make sure we're talking with our brothers and sisters on the ground who are trying to do this to find out what do they mean, what is happening, uh, and recognize that there are some places where where if I spend eight hours a day for six months with a brand new believer, he's probably going to grow differently than the person that I'm investing in one day a week. Uh, now, would I call his growth rapid? I, I might. It's certainly more rapid than what I see in my church here in the, in the States. That, that word is, it carries a whole lot of baggage that begs for conversations with our brothers and sisters who are out there giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. Uh, again, I don't differ with the, with the criticisms. I just want us to make sure we're having conversations with the people who are also defining the terms. And if you were to go to the Together for the Gospel website, not from this year, but from 2016, the message I gave there, in, endurance needed, strength for a slow reformation, the dangerous allure of speed. I talk about this. Say it's, it's, it's one of your better sermons, brother. Say the name again. Endurance needed. Endurance needed. You should strength, write this down. You really should write this strength down. Strength for a slow reformation Listen. and the dangerous allure of speed. It's together for the gospel, t4g.org, 2016. What, one last thing on this. What about Acts 2, 4, and 6 and numbers? They name numbers. Why should we be concerned about numbers? Because what I often hear from rapid growth types is like, look, we, we're gonna achieve this many numbers, we're gonna aim for this many numbers and this number of cities and these churches planted. You see numbers in Acts. What's wrong with numbers? And an emphasis on numbers and aiming at certain numbers. 
Well, when I, when I hear pastor friends, and I've had more than one, tell me that they want to see what happened the day of Pentecost reproduced in their own churches, I know they mean well, and I think it's a profoundly ignorant statement. Pentecost is like the exodus for the church. It's a unique event in salvation history. You don't see it repeated again and again and again and again throughout the pages of the New Testament. God is establishing his people initially as an international people. Now that doesn't mean there've never been any revivals since then. There've been revivals involving far greater numbers of people than there were at Pentecost. But just the descriptions that we see there are not simply and straightforwardly, hey, this is how you do church every Sunday. It's this is God giving birth to the new community, uh, just exactly like he did in a parallel fashion in the Exodus. Anything else on this, guys? Yeah, yeah, I'm not actually, I'm not opposed to us asking numerical questions. I I do want to know if I'm leading my church and we're reaching nobody, one of the ways I find that out is at least to ask the numerical question. I think part of our problem is if the only question we're asking, the only numerical question we're asking is how many people are we reporting going through our baptismal waters, I think that's insufficient. I think it is a valid question but if I'm going to ask that question, I also want to know how many of those folks are actually showing evidence of conversion. I trust we've looked at that prior to baptizing them, uh, at least at some level. Uh, I want to know how many of them are living in spiritual disciplines, how many are loving their, their spouses as they ought to. So in that sense, I don't think we ask enough numerical questions if that question helps us to look at are they giving evidence of genuine conversion. And, uh, and the other thing is, I, I think there's a difference between looking back at saying, wow, look at what the Lord has done with all these people, or on the front end saying, faithfulness looks like if this number of people don't get saved, that we haven't been doing anything faithfully. Or um, uh, this sets us up for disappointment if God decides to do things in a slower way. Mark, you had a story about Martin Lloyd-Jones. Is that a good closing of the day story? Well, yeah, uh, perhaps. Um, when, uh, when I was living in Cambridge, England from 1988 to 1994, uh, I got to know Dr. Lloyd-Jones' widow quite well. Uh, Bethan Lloyd-Jones uh, was living with her daughter, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth and Fred Catherwood were some of my wife and my best friends. They were the age of our parents, or grandparents even, but um, Fred was serving as an elder at the church, and Elizabeth and Connie were kind of similarly constituted emotionally, my wife Connie and Elizabeth Catherwood, Lloyd-Jones' daughter. And so uh, we, would, we literally every Sunday had lunch with them after church. Uh, and Bethan, Mrs. Lloyd-Jones, was talking to me once about the revivals in Aberystwyth. So if you know the Lloyd-Jones' ministry at all, there's the long ministry in London, but before that, there's a, a shorter ministry in Aberystwyth, a, a town in Wales that was uh, in hard times economically. And she said, you know, people, she was saying, People only know the glories of revival. They don't realize how hard it is and how slow it is and how much work it involves. Martin was just exhausted in the study all the time with drunks coming to talk to him, people repenting of their drunkenness. She said there was day after day when he literally would get a wheelbarrow to take it into his office to put all the bottles, you know, the empty or half empty bottles and wheel them out to the trash. She said, these are the kind of things nobody ever asks about, nobody ever writes about, nobody ever thinks about, but this is a part of the revival that's real, that, you know, is, you you, you can't, you can't ignore. It's part of the whole story. So that was just a little anecdote that I don't know was written down in Memories of Sandfields, you know, or or in any of the Banner of Truth books, but that it's just one first person testimony of, yeah, when a great move of the Spirit of God happens, sin is messy. And sin involves you in a lot of people with a lot of mess in their lives. And it's, you're, yeah, you're going to get dirty uh, if you're involved in that kind of revival. Hmm. A great dirty to have. For real. So, a, a book recommendation for someone who's maybe listening to this conversation and recognizing in their own heart this temptation to uh, a poor notion of rapidity or this temptation to trying to manufacture results or presuming that results should come. I love Zach Eswine's little book, The Ordinary Pastor, or the, yeah, The Ordinary Pastor. It's the shorter version of his longer book, Sensing Jesus. 
Um, he's doing a lot of good pastoral work on these very issues, the presumption we sometimes have about what God must do or will do and how we'll take that into our own hands. So if you want to think more about that, uh, I think that's an excellent book. E-S-W-I-N-E-S-Y. Yes. Ordinary pastor. <laughs>